Sound check. Check one. Check two. Hello, Heidi. How are you? Hi, Dr. Dan. That was such a nice introduction because I've been a fan of yours, as I just revealed to you earlier. So it is my honor and pleasure. Oh, you you are too kind. And, and as I said to you off camera, I've just been such a fan of your brain <laughs> for so long. And, it's, Very and it's, it's because of your capacity to... Um, I guess, deliver complex concepts in such an accessible way. And that's why I'm excited to have you on the show today, because I know that's what you're going to be able to do for us in talking about what is such a fascinating, I, I certainly find it fascinating, <laughs> discussion around all the new things that we are learning, and some old things, actually, uh, that we're learning about neuroscience and how it implicates itself on singing. But before we get to that, I, I so, so many people watching today, well, there'll be people who definitely do know who you are because in the singing teacher world, you are very well known. But for everyone else, I wonder if you could just give us a little bit of an insight into who is Heidi Moss. <laughs> oh, goodness. This is always the hardest part, right? Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> Well, I started out as both a singer and a scientist, so I sort of grew up with both. But I'm in the classical world, that's how I started, um, and studied with Richard Miller at Oberlin, who was one of those historical pedagogues who studied the anatomy and physiology of singing. And then, um, for whatever reason, I went on and did graduate work in biochemistry, but still sang. I kept both alive. Uh, and I dabbled in neuroscience then. Uh, and then when I hit age 30, I had been taking lessons that whole time and won a couple competitions and switched from being a scientist in a lab, I was working on telomeres, then to being a full-time mm -hmm. singer and teacher, which sounds like a big leap, but at the time, because I was doing both, I always say science and music are very similar. It's that technical foundation but to really make magic, it's the creativity on top of that. So I was singing professionally for about six years and teaching, and then I came down with a rare cranial nerve injury. I always say, if it looks like I'm winking at you, you don't know whether I'm winking at you <laughs> or if it's just the disability. But <laughs> anyway, so that reframed because I was told I'd never sing again. Um, and it was just devastating. I didn't sing for two years, but I was taught how to read papers. So that's what I did is t read some neuroscience papers and, and rehabilitated myself wow. through, because the mechanism was fine. It was just how my brain signaled to it that was broken. So that got me, this was in 2007, um, into the neuroscience of singing. And here I am. <laughs> it's it's fascinating, isn't it? And when we're not going to um, talk much more about um, the injury that you that you had, but um, it's fascinating, isn't it? Just it's just is it a misfire of of the nerve? What what what's going um, on? Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, most people know it as like a Bell's palsy is the mild mild version of it. I right. just had a very severe where it was very high up in the cranial nerve, so it right. affected my larynx. It affected all the muscles of my face. Um, and so what happens is when the nerves die, um, which they died completely, they do regrow, but they regrow without a path. So basically, it's more about body mapping. We talk about where you know our brain knows where certain things are mm. and you function based on where those things are so the analogy i give is if i you know i grab a cup my brain knows how to grab that cup because it knows my hand it knows the distance but if suddenly i extended my arm a foot and had to navigate the world or there are these fun experiments where they actually shift someone's vision and they you know what's right is left and yes. left is right yes it throws the brain off yeah yes. so that's what happened and i do have so when they regrow then then they regrow without a map and then they contract all the time so right now right. my larynx you know my superhyoid muscles my face i say it's like having arnold schwarzenegger <laughs> living on my neck and face they're just constantly hyperactive and hyper contracting wow 
Well, yeah. Can I can I tell you, and and we'll 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 leave this part of our discussion after this. But can I tell you, I, I listened to a recent performance that you put on Facebook. Yeah. Was it yesterday? Oh yeah. Yesterday or the day before? Anyway. Um, yeah. You. It was beautiful. You. You couldn't. You yeah. couldn't tell. You know that you would be struggling and 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 managing all of that. So, yeah. I I just think that's amazing. So. Thank you. That a means a lot. A yeah. hat tip to you. Um, <laughs> yeah. Let's let's dive into today's topic because I've got this <gasps> little wonderful paper. Oh, no. dun, 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 a dun, 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 dun. paper. It's a science paper, <laughs> um, uh, published in the Journal of Singing, and it's called a "Vocal Learning and Songbird Vocal Learning and Songbirds: An Evolutionary Tale of Singing" by none other than Heidi <laughs> Moss Erickson, and this is. This is, I think, and it's a part of a new series, yeah, within the Journal of Singing um, called Minding the Gap. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Um, and a little play on the UK yeah. subway system. So <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be, I think, such a beneficial series. Uh, well, if only to one person, me. Um, <laughs> no, it will be beneficial to so many people within the voice pedagogy space because. You and I both come from the same, I guess, era of vocal pedagogy. I I grew up. I I didn't have the great honor of working, you know, with or being meeting the none other than the Richard Miller. But I certainly his his textbook was Bible for for so long, and right. um, the structure of singing. And it sits proudly over on my <laughs> and and I still occasionally will will reference it because. There's so much, you know, strong information in there that stands true today. Right. But voice science has has evolved, hasn't it? We've, we, there's so much more that we know. I wonder if we can just use that as a leaping, you know, a starting point to kind of just open up the discussion around neuroscience and voice. What, what are you observing in our, in our understanding? Yeah, I mean, I love that you brought up Richard Miller because I was fortunate he died right about a year after I had gotten my paralysis. So I had reached out to him. Wow. And so <laughs> what I learned from that is that, you know, textbooks are snapshots in time. Yes. And so sometimes we take these <clears throat> texts as Bible. And what speaking with Richard during that time taught me, because he had this thing, one of the reasons I reached out to him is in his text, he's like, the zygomatic lift increases resonances, you know? So I was like, Richard, I can't do that anymore, but I think can you, you can still hear those resonances. And he said, hi, and I have this in an email, you know, when I published that, I wasn't quite sure, and now I don't believe it anymore. And <laughs> it just wow. proved to me, because I was raised in science, that, oh yeah, science evolves and people change their mind when new data comes out. Yeah. But singing, we take some of these historical texts and we think that the person who wrote them would believe them until the end of time. So that yeah. was one really interesting manifestation of that, that he has these books that live, but he even changed his mind on some of his own philosophies. Um, as far as neuroscience goes, as we were talking, um, anatomy and physiology has been around for hundreds of years. And so studying that has been relatively straightforward. However, the brain is so much harder to study uh, for obvious reasons, because it's very difficult even in real time right now to know what is coordinating my speech. Um, however, in the past, I would say 10 years, maybe 15, um, technologies have evolved. And that's what science is all about, is what technology is available to figure out certain questions. Um, and so that technology has just opened Pandora's box in terms of neuroscience. And so where we were with anatomy and physiology in the early 1800s is sort of where we were with neuroscience 20 years ago, but now it's just ramping up. So I think for singers, because it's a brain, I call it the brain body environment continuum. Yeah. You know, we, it's this loop, right? It's our, what we think, what we feel, what we want to communicate, um, what our teacher's guiding us. That's the environment, how we feel that day. Are we stressed or not? Uh, and then our mechanism. So if we can understand all of those signals that go into the mechanism, 
could that help us as singers and teachers? And that's sort of what has been my passion for the past, you know, 17 years. <laughs> I, I wonder whether, isn't it wonderful to hear you talk about someone who was so highly respected within the, the voice teaching, the voice pedagogy world like Richard Miller say to you very clearly, I don't believe that anymore. I've learnt something new. And yeah. we need to hear more of that, don't we? <laughs> a thousand percent. I love being wrong. I yeah. love it. I even had a student because I teach you know, breath a certain way. And he, and I encourage singers if they want another coaching or another teacher to like, it takes a village. It takes different ways of saying things. And he said, Heidi, you're going to get mad at me. You know, this teacher said something, but it worked, but it's not what you think. And I said, are you kidding me? That's the best news ever. Because if it worked, then it's right. You know, the <clears throat> why is a separate question. You know, pedagogy and voice science don't always overlap. You know, I think there's some, I think it's Ian Howell says some lies are true. And, and my theory is as a teacher, if it works, that's great. Yeah. And, and so I think we need more of that. You know, there yes. isn't in a complex mechanism, which singing is, it's the most complex behavior, by the way. Yeah. That's one thing, you know, speech is very complex. Singing is on top of that. And I even say singing isn't an instrument um, yeah. because it's beyond an instrument. Um, there's a hundred muscles we're coordinating in milliseconds. So of course there's going to be a million ways to get yeah. at a target, yeah, you know, yeah, not yeah. one way and, or, you know, yeah. so that's sort of my philosophy. And, and we I need more. And I think too, and, and I, I, the, I was actually just thinking this this morning with one of my professional students, we were doing some work and we'd been, and you know, the, the, the longer I do, this is my 28th year of teaching. So yeah. compared to, compared to many, still a baby, mm -hmm. but, um, yeah. but been doing it a little while. And do you know what? The, the longer I do this, the less confident I become. <laughs> it's, it, you, do, you, do you know what I'm saying? Like it's, it really yeah. is this because there is so much to know and so little that you can be absolutely, that, I went to say, there's so little that you can be absolutely certain of. There, there are many things that we can be certain of, but equally there are those times where a student will go i'm doing the exact opposite to what you've just told me to do and it's working and you have but to go what... well then do that <laughs> ignore me do that. You know, but that's exactly what i think neuroscience will tell you that then that's that's right because in a way we can't know all but what every singer wants to execute this crazy, I'm even amazed we can do it. I always say yeah. like you have, pre every time we sing, it's a new situation environmentally. You're never yeah. going to sing the same place you are at any given time. <clears throat> and all of these things from your brain are going to feed that mechanism. It's going to be what you, a teacher said the week before. It's going to be what you experienced the day before. It's going to be maybe even <clears throat> something you heard 20 years ago all feeds into the motor pathway. Yeah. So that's why in a way we can't be wrong as teachers sometimes because what we're doing is we're giving a student a chance to play and experiment yes. and get more yes. data to create a motor output. Like babies when they're playing with things, you yeah. know, a baby doesn't like say, oh my gosh, that was terrible if it can't reach it or, you know, it just keeps trying. It just what, keeps trying new things and then it gets better mapped. It, it might be bold of me to say that I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful that this won't be the last time you're ever on the show. So I'm hoping <laughs> that you. future conversations can go down the road of play because I love, I say to my students all the time, play, play, please play, explore, experiment, explore. But that will take us off tangent today a little <laughs> so, yes and i do have an article on that i know so. i know and i've read it so <laughs> oh, okay. but let's let's go back with my to my monster everyone uh. needs a monster <laughs> <laughs> i wonder if we you you make a point in the article that we are talking about today okay <laughs> um about the fact that there are eight other species that vocalize can you, can you talk to that a little bit and, and, and really identify what, what does make us a little different as human beings? Not a little, a lot different as well, human yeah. beings. 
I love this question because this surprised me. Ironically, the person who made that discovery about, it's called vocal learning, which is what these species do. And um, it is an ability that is a part of what's called convergent evolution. People think of evolution, like chimpanzees are our nearest not you know non-human primates right yeah. those they're our neighbors we share 99 percent of our dna with chimpanzees and we have a lot of social behaviors that are similar however chimpanzees cannot flexibly control pitch or do any kind of vocal communication on demand so they are not vocal learners so here we have this species that's very close to us but can't do what we do However, these other species, and songbirds is the, um, the most analogous and the most well-studied, and it happened to be at the same university I was doing my research at. And back in those days, I was like, why are people studying songbirds? And I'd go to lectures and I'd be like, what the heck is this? Well, now, you know, 25 years later, I'm like, oh, the, I needed to know that. The great wisdom of hindsight, right? <laughs> exactly. So what convergent evolution, it happens all the time. The analogy I give are sharks and dolphins. Sharks and dolphins, if you've ever been in the ocean, they can look very similar. And you think, oh my gosh, am I going to get eaten? Or, oh, that's a cute thing that's going to, you know, blow. But they're all, you know, gray, shiny. They have a fin. But one's a mammal and one is a fish. So that is convergent evolution. There was a characteristic that made sense for both and it happened serendipitously. So what happened with a vocal learner that songbirds, our brains in vocalization are more like songbirds. If you Google parrots, I use one where Beyonce, there's a parrot that can mimic Beyonce perfectly. It's actually amazing. Um, I highly don't recommend Googling parrots that can uh, say expletives because there's a lot of those as well. <laughs> but there was this random duplication <laughs> in um, evolution that created this second pathway. Yeah. And it's close to where the hands and fingers are. And I won't go into the nuance of why that happened, but we have two areas of our brain as opposed to chimps that just has one that signal for our vocal mechanism, for the larynx, the dorsal and the ventral laryngeal motor cortex. And in brief, what the new one does, the dorsal laryngeal motor cortex, the ventral, you don't need to know these things, but the one that the chimps has and the ones that the songbirds have, and we have both and songbirds have both, is what's responsible for that flexible pitch on command kind of thing. So it's basically involved in controlling our execution of pitch to our larynx. Whatever signal for pitch will go to the larynx and that comes from that area. As opposed to the conserved one, chimpanzees can make sound, dogs can make sound, cats can make sound, you may hear one later. And that is just the folds coming together randomly, which is what the ventral does. There are other signals that can make it adjust to different calls or you know the loud meow but it's not specific in terms of pitch yeah. and that's really the difference between what a vocal learner can do and what a non-vocal learner can do so the flexibility then of how how does because we don't we don't just create sound as human beings we we take that pitch we alter it but we also shape it don't we we've got this this flex, flexible vocal tract that not only articulates but filters resonance. How how did that yes. come about? So that is actually, you know, it's not, I don't really know if anyone knows how that evolved as an ability, but the one thing we do know in terms of vocal tracks is that a baby and a chimp <laughs> are identical in their vocal tract ability. So if you measure a chimp because the larynx is high in a baby, um, just like a chimp, their tongue flexibility. But what happens, so the difference between a baby and a chimp then, a baby can evolve to get certain sound palettes and start to filter, is that vocal learning. Now we're gonna get into, the, into a more complicated thing, but all of our vocal ability, including breath, including articulator movements, and these two areas of the dorsal laryngeal motor cortex 
and auditory. Believe it or not, your auditory cortex is suppressed when you speak or sing, and it goes to the dorsal laryngeal motor cortex. It's crazy. All of these areas involved in vocalization start to consolidate. Mm. And the reason they do that is because the closer you are in the brain, the faster things can signal. So vocalization is an outlier as a motor skill because it has to happen fast. It has to coordinate over a hundred muscles fast. And this is what songbirds have. And this is what humans have. Um, and so therefore everything involved in vocalization gets shifted around so that it's close to each other so that they can start signaling and coordinating. Um, so that's the best way I can explain it in terms of the res source filter. You know, I know people, that's a model and people always say it's, it's looped and you know, we have, but you can even put respiration into that category mm. that respiration on its own is different than respiration in vocalization because that the brain is calculating that based on the vocalization. And, and, and that is another tributary that I, I want to get you back in the future to talk to. Is yeah. Birth. But, but I, I do want to just, you mentioned the word coordination just before, and, and of course, coordinating the voice, because there is so many, you mentioned there's 100 muscles coordinating together, firing off together to do their thing. <laughs> How do we do this? How do we do this? Know. So you mentioned in the, in the article, you mentioned things um, that practice can actually change your gene expression. Yes. Yes. Oh, sorry. See, I told you I'm a class that, early. That's all right. Um, yeah. What, tell, t tell me, tell me, what is gene expression? <laughs> gene expression is, we always think of it in terms of like, you know, I, I'm breeding dogs and, you know, they're going to be a, a certain feature of that animal that will get <laughs> passed down. That's one level of gene expression. But there are other levels of gene expression that like, it's like turning on a signal or turning off a signal. And that's what learning is because we need to learn and generate new pathways and new connections. And so what happens is in the brain is that when we do new experiences, again, I love using babies because I honestly think singers are more like we're as we as singers are more like babies than we like to think we are. But it's a good thing because babies play and babies, their gene expression is changing because of learning and they get better and better and better with that kind of exploring the world and experiencing. Um, so that's what happens with practice. Now, the thing with singing is, is that we can, and we've all been there, where we have something that is learned <laughs> that is much harder to unlearn. And so that idea of having to unlearn takes more effort for the brain because you're undoing sort of it's like a, a well-worn path like tires in the road you know wow. and so you're gonna have to try to cave a new you know that's why I, my rehabilitation was hard but we have that at, at any level of learning where you have a way and then if you have to change it it's like learning a new language almost it's, um, it, and it does involve gene expression and changing neural pathways we 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 talk about certainly in in on the show here in the past and and you know as a part of my lessons i do talk about the the development of those new new neural pathways but can i say to you the 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 idea that we we also have to um er, you know re are we erasing old pathways in to 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 form new ones how are they yeah. forming together What's happening there? Yeah, so it's, it's we're not really ever erasing, mm. um, but what we're doing is rerouting. You know, yeah. it's like if you have a stream yes. and you know, you're trying desperately to carve out so the water goes a certain way. And I think the best, the hardest thing, but also the best way I try to word it is that um, it is a prediction. So just like the weather, if you have the weather, the weatherman will tell me tomorrow it's going to be cloudy. Well, how do they know that? They have a lot of data from a lot of measurements that they're taking to predict the weather. Well, that's what every motor behavior is. It's a prediction. So what happens is if you have a lot of data 
to do, you know, we can even give an example to like, maybe, you know, we can talk press phonation or something like that, or a lot of effort. That prediction is just really well wired. The brain is going to say, I have to make this sound and I remember doing this. Yeah. And so how can you get then your brain to say, wait a minute, that may not be the best, most efficient way. You need to give it a lot of data, just like the weatherman, you know, whether it comes from, huh, no pun intended, maybe different inputs to get to g start making that stream. However, if I keep focusing on the same kind of output, I'm going to be reinforcing that. So something maybe even completely crazy, like I'll sometimes have people, you know, throw a ball on the ground for, uh, you know, I hate the word high note because there really is no such thing, but it's finding something opposite that will then start clearing that new pathway. They have a different association so that you can get a different prediction rather than just trying to conquer it over and over again because the brain's like, oh, I remember this. I'm going to do it that way, that kind of thing. So yeah. that's the way we rewire is like algorithms in a way. M much of that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love that. I love that rerouting idea that, you know, um, I'm going skiing in, in four weeks, something I love to do. And yeah. um, as, as dr we always drive, we always take two days to drive to, I'm that far away from a ski field. I, I live in the wrong part of the world. <laughs> you have to visit me. I, Tahoe's <laughs> just an hour and a half up oh, the road. <laughs> stop it. That's very naughty. Okay. So we have to drive two days to get to where we are and the, and the, the freeways that we take, often you'll see the old roads on the side that are sort of starting to be overgrown and, but you could probably take a bike along them. You know, you couldn't drive right. a car, but so is, do they, are they sort of still sort of sitting there? And if, if you made the mistake of reverting to old habits, is that, are they going to refire and redevelop? Yeah, I mean, it's it's any pathway that gets used gets, you know, there's something called myelination. I use the analogy between like a wire and then the plastic that's around it. Yeah. And that's what a nerve is like. It's, yes. a, it's a wire that has plastic around it. And the more you use a pathway, yeah. the more myelin coating it gets. Yes. Now, it will, so if you have a really strong pathway, it'll be very difficult. You have to basically make one that is stronger in terms of its myelination. And these are, you know, very complicated things, but that idea of it will be a memory and it's very difficult to let go of that, but you can rewire. I mean, that's what my disability proved in mm. a way is, and I'm still rewiring some things because mm. I did have, I lost about a perfect fifth of my upper range. That was the biggest. And I was a high soprano Yeah, and I'm still, you know, inching my way back up, you know, definitely regained probably a major third and even got a, another half step about a year ago. So I do feel that there's, there's always possibilities. Like we have yeah. to look at it that we can do anything, that yeah. the brain's very plastic. They call it neuroplasticity yeah. and it should give us hope yes. rather than make us feel limited. Yeah. That's and sort of my, I'm a grass is always greener kind and, of person and anyway. And your lived experience is a testament. And I think we need to give us all singers hope. Yes. You know? And your lived experience is a testament to that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I had teachers and neurologists who said I wouldn't sing again. So, you know, yeah. that's and the biggest revenge. I, I, <laughs> I, I, it was science, ironically. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want to get to a buzzword because I think okay. uh, the buzzword being dopamine. Ah. Ah. What, what role we're talking about, you know, forming new neural pathways, um, strengthening that sheath of the, of the, um, of the nerve, what, what role do, have we found that dopamine plays in securing and maturing those pathways? Yeah. Dopamine. I mean, they're all these wondrous, they're called neurotransmitters and they're basically the chemical signature 
that flows in the brain to have different tasks. And the simplest way, even though dopamine does a lot of different things, just like serotonin does a lot of different things, you may have heard of that, or norepinephrine, all of these things, but dopamine really is our motivational seeker um, molecule. So in terms of learning, we have to have as the learner, it can't be imposed on us. It has to be self-motivated to be motivated to learn. And when that happens, you do get a dopamine surge. And then you get the reward of succeeding in, you know, I, the now I love going back to like, I call it caveman biology, cave woman, cave person biology. But I think if we can always frame ourselves in that mindset, it helps us understand our biology because we haven't evolved as humans, but our society has. So if we were a cave person and we were hunter gathering, we would walk for days and be starving and then we would find food. That, so we had dopamine to get us there to motivate us to walk and toil. We found the food, we ate it, and then we chilled. Now, why do you do that? Why does once you get the reward, do you stop? Well, because you don't wanna have to expend then more energy and go on and go on and go on. You want to sort of stay where that reward was. So that happens in micro levels. We were talking offline about kids and electronics. And so you're getting a dopamine surge. What happens when you get a surge is that it drops right after you get your reward below baseline. Yeah. So that means you're going to need even more to get you back to a seeking pathway. And then that progresses such that you're going to need more, oops, more and more and more and more and more. So that's why that habit, we need dopamine to motivate, but we need to temper it with results and challenge and, and so forth and so on. So there is kind of a pace to learning um, that I think is helpful. Yeah. But everyone's different too, but that's the, the dopamine process the, anyway. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating what we, what we, we, I mean, not just learning today and learning in general about, yeah. you know, the, the interplay of these chemicals and it's, it's, it's amazing. We've, we've talked, we've kind of talked a lot so far in our discussion today about, um, you know, how to sing in the, you know, the, the process thereof. But you, you also do explore in the article why we sing, you know, what, and we, you kind of started to, to head in that direction with the discussion around the dopamine, but can you, you know, you, your research has, has delved into that area of, uh, why, why, why do we sing? Exactly. I think this question, I, I, I can't remember in the, you know, years and years that I had voice lessons that the why was ever talked about in yeah. terms of, you know, there's anthropological reasons that we vocalize in terms of social bonding, group cohesion, um, you know, but, and, and then there's like biological reasons, communication. So ultimately, anytime we speak or sing, it has to have what I call now an intention, meaning is the intention to say, I love you, or is the intention to say, give me that piece of cheese, <laughs> you know, or, and once you have that intention, then you have an affect. So what are you flavoring that intention with? Is the, I love you blase, I love you, or is it like, oh, I love you, or like, I want that cheese. So that's, that's every vocalization our brain requires that we infuse it with that. I, I joke about with my singers, I'm like, what, you know, essential oil are you infusing in your, your singing? You know, because it's, it, ha it can't just be an exercise for an exercise that cuts off a huge part of our brain yeah. from infusing. Now, the problem with singing, especially, you know, in classical, but in any genre, is that the energy required to make this sound is sometimes opposite of what the um, emotional intention is or the intention and affect. If I'm singing a sad song, sad, and I, we have to be authentic, I know, in the moment, but at least in the rehearsal part, 
that there's a disconnect for the brain there because sad to the brain is like Eeyore is very maybe soft, breathy, mm -hmm. you know, low. So I always give, I actually, I don't have them here, but I have like emotion cards and character cards that I will have singers play with in the studio because it will give the brain information that may not be literal to the song, but will be helpful to the voice. It'll give it an energy or I'll give a weird image. Like if it's a sad song, I'll like pretend they're sheep clouds and you're tickling their bellies and people think <laughs> I'm nuts, you know, but the truth is this is science, right? Cause if it's light, like light, you know, some people, if it's, you know, it needs to be light. You don't want to say light or light or even quiet is without energy for the voice. So that's yeah. why I'm like, you're tickling little sheep clouds. And then it's like, Ooh, you know, <laughs> so those kinds of detail, even though people say, well, I'm not being authentic to the song. It's like, that's not what we're talking about right now. We're trying yeah. to give, you're a vocal learner cave person. Your brain needs information to create a motor output that you want that matches the sound, not the song part. It's like baking a cake. You'll be able to interpret the song as much as you want once your voice gets the information it needs to make a sound that it wants. But it's not always going to be literal. Um, and I always say the reason why singing high and soft is hard is, or why people add weight is because biologically, the only reason is to say, there's a tiger over there, you know? And so our brain wants to add weight. It wants to add all sorts of things that's in, at least in classical singing, we're trying to take away for some of the top. We're trying to take away weight, but still have energy. So you need these affect and intention to get a motor output, if that makes sense. And it it's fun though. That's the thing. Being crazy and silly is, and playing is fun, but it actually has a scientific purpose for the brain. And so that's why people are like, Heidi, I thought you were a scientist. Why are you doing all these crazy things? It's like, yeah, that's all I do. <laughs> So where, where I'm going to ask you to sort of look into the crystal ball now a little, because like, like we were just saying earlier, you know, you and I both came up in the, what I refer to as the physiology chapter, the anatomy chapter of learning to teach singing, vo mm -hmm. vocal pedagogy. We have recently been by, you know, with great thanks to ones like Ian Howe and Ken Bozeman, we've been going through the resonance slash, you know, acoustics chapter of vocal pedagogy. Um, what, what implication do you think? What, where is this all headed? You know, with this new understanding of neuroscience and how our brain learns, um, where, where <laughs> I'm asking you to predict the future. Yeah. No, I can't predict the future. I mean, I love all that stuff. I mean, and I think there's what I like to say is observation is an action. So I think it is important, especially for those who are teachers to at least have a basic, I mean, we were talking about that, you know, no one can be an expert in everything. So that is, you know, I look to Ian and I look to Ken for their expertise in their realm. Um, and I take what I can use and credit them for that. Mm. Um, I do think, though, that there will always be the passion for understanding the mechanism and the passion for understanding acoustics and using those terms and tools that we do pedagogically. I think, though, at least I hope that what will happen eventually is that, say you have an hour lesson, that that hour lesson will be much less focused on random exercises. Because I always say, if you're doing a scale, then what is, with a hundred muscles, what are you learning to do a scale? I do very pedagogy. Now this is just me, some people need that. I do have students who want exercises for ritual, but I, I think we'll have more targeted and more fun pedagogy where I think the brain stuff will lead us down a path of less thinky. I mean, I think that's the kind of thing that I, I think surprises people when they know that I'm into science, mm. but the way I teach is much less thinky and much more 
a kid in a playground. And then I can use the tools like what Ken and Ian, or I, I do a lot of visual biofeedback with Voce Vista. We can use those tools to sort of tweak, but that's not the fundamental core of what the lesson is. Is it, that makes sense. Is it kind of like, are you talking here about um, seeking a, I'm just, I'm, I'm making this up on the spot. So this, I hope this comes no. across. It's almost like yeah. seek, seeking a, a place of Zen, a, a place of psychological flow in a lesson so that you can just be in a state of less thinky to use your term. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, attention is a huge resource. I, yeah. I, you know, some, I have, I, and we are not good multitaskers. So if we're thinking about a very specific muscle and really focusing attention on that or, or then we're we're diverting attention from other things that the brain needs and in reality now that we know it's predictive i actually have really good like very short youtube videos on what the prediction is i call it like axe throwing you use those kinds of micro attentions in a reductionist way. So I think we're going to do maybe more, I don't know if that makes sense, reductionist singing to generate those kinds of, this is what this feels like, rather than singing. A lot of singers want to do all the words, all the notes, the entire song from beginning to end, right as they walk in. Yeah. And I think we have to frame that that actually is not the best way to learn. I think we need to do more listening, audiation, yes. breaking things apart. I, you know, th there's a reason why phone numbers are the length that they are because our brain can't hold, hold that, that much. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the vocal learning research shows that they chunk things. They chunk in very short patterns. Babies do it. Humans do it. Songbirds do it. And then you play within those patterns. So yeah. I'll do that in a song. I'll have, say, say if someone's doing a riff. I love riffs. I mean, I do, I, that's one of the reasons I actually started following you is because I started having to teach more, you know, pop music and things like that and, and musical theater. And, and, and now, I mean, I just, I love riffs just because they're just such a great vocal learning tool. Yeah, they're clever. And <laughs> someone will start by mimicking, but then we'll chunk it and then I'll have them invert it you know, mm -hmm, just a small mm -hmm, chunk. Mm -hmm. I'll have them come from above. I'll have them mm -hmm. change the rhythm. I'll have them. And then by the end of these little micro chunks, they're going, they're doing the whole thing. Yeah. But if they tried to do the whole riff the same way over and over again, it wouldn't click as fast as it does when you do these kinds of micro yes. mixing it up, yeah. you know, and that's yeah. the vocal learning thing. That's what the vocal learning brain wants. It wants chunks. It wants to mix it up. And you know that is kind of is it possible? And I and I'm and I'm genuinely asking this question uh, out of uh, interest in what you think. Is, is it possible that there is a, um, a a foundational level of technical skill that a singer does need to acquire before they can enter into this play space? It's um, it's, back in my undergrad days, I did a a paper yeah. on acknowledging that some of the most drilled musicians are jazz musicians and yet they're the ones that are doing all the improvisation yet they have to spend so much time practicing yeah. scales so that they don't come off sounding like they're doing scales um yeah what, what are your I mean, thoughts that's about that that's a great question. I do think that there's individual. I teach a lot of beginners. One of my favorite jobs was I taught voice at Google, <laughs> which was a, a perk for, you know, employees yeah. just to relax. Uh -huh. um, I teach at UC Davis, which has a very, you know, I teach a class called Singing for All. And I find that if you can, I think every singer needs to play. Yeah. I just think that that's the dopamine. That's the... And I found that I get singers who are, can't even pitch match to a piano. That was yeah. my, and yeah. able to sing something in eight weeks because of this kind of more reductionist pedagogy. It's, it's steps. It's, it's like ba yes. baking a cake, yeah. but I'll turn a little pattern and do audiation and do different things with it. So I think it is, I think all levels can do that unless they're a music, which yeah. is only about 2.5%. Yep. Yes. But I do think the foundation comes, they're coupled. We can't really uncouple this orb of mm. technique 
yeah. and yeah. The, the, and interpretation and fun and play because it's all feeding the algorithm. Yeah. So I may be an outlier in thinking that way, but I've worked with enough super beginners that have never sung before yeah. that I feel like they've never had to learn anything super technical, but they mm. improve mm. with this kind mm. of, I, you know, I trick them. I say, yeah. I'm tricking your larynx. They don't yes. know why I'm inverting something or yes. why I'm yes. saying, okay, this interval, they're off pitch. Yeah. Why am I coming at it from above? They yeah. don't know why I just, yeah. I'm like, or why are they swinging their arms up or why are they throwing a ball? You know, those have, you can make technical directives out of fun. Yeah. If that makes sense. It does make sense. And, and I'm looking down at the time and realizing we, 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 we have to finish. Um, and, and, and it's actually a good place for us to finish in part because we're finishing where I'd like to pick up perhaps next time. And that is talking more about play and, and, the, and the powerful space that that is for learning um, because we don't yes. do enough of it as adults. Uh, and, exactly. and most people who are watching today's show and watch, watch the show in general, hello to everyone who's still watching. Um, thank <laughs> you. For, thank you for sticking around for the full show. Yeah. Um, yeah. don't, we don't play enough, do we? We don't, we don't give ourselves permission to, no. in a sense, make mistakes. And anyway, we'll, we'll, we, we will, yeah. that is for another, another time. Yeah. I always say there's no such thing as mistakes no. or giving your brain information. <laughs> yeah. 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 And it's, it's learning to not load the, the word mistake. We need to re reclaim that word, don't we? To, to not load it as a negative, but see yeah. it as a, as a positive and a gateway to learning. Right. Um, and you talked about dopamine. I'll just say the flip side of that is cortisol and too much cortisol and stress and mm, wanting to be right. Mm inhibits learning yeah it is really and i think all of this criticism in you know i know it affected me as a student and we see it in our culture with shows where they're just criticizing all the time i say we're selecting for resilience in singers and not always for talent and, and so always. that's that's yeah. where i'll yeah. yeah so more play more play thank you so much it was thank you it, you know, I've, I've actually got other questions here that we just simply didn't get to, yeah, but okay. we covered so much ground today. And I really hope that, that those of you who have been watching have, have learned, well, how could you not have learned something today? There's, <laughs> there's so many layers there. And, uh, Heidi, I just want to say thank you for being so gracious and, uh, so giving of your time and expertise with us today. Um, Something Thank that I'm you. continually humbled by is just the level of uh, expert that we get on to the show, and and you are no different in that. I'm just so so thankful and, and grateful that you came on and had a chat. Thank you so much for having me, and as I said, I'm a fan, and and it takes a village. You know, we all have our little seeds that we pollinate this amazing art with. So and, thank you for yours. And too. you have you have dropped more than your fair share of seeds today, <laughs> and, <laughs> and and I have watched many of your seeds over the last number of years grow into really fruitful trees. So thank you. Thank you so much. It's yeah. been a pleasure. Well, I, I said, didn't I, at the beginning in the intro, I said, this will be amazing. And it was because Heidi is just so, so, it, again, it's, it's not just that Heidi's amazing. It's not just that the guests that we get on are amazing. It's the, it's the manner, the maturity in which they deliver their information. It's so accessible. It's so understandable. And it really gives us access to really take hold of that and implement it into our everyday, which is hopefully what you'll be able to do over the next week as you get back into your own singing practice. And I do hope you have a great week. Next week, we are doing a Q&A. Uh, so make sure you come along with all of your questions. I do my, um, my humble best to answer your questions. And uh, we do that. Um, well, we'll do it next week. We, we get together every Monday at 1 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. We regularly have fantastic guests just like Heidi on the show. And we'll continue to do that through uh, 2023. So make sure you subscribe. Hit the white bell icon. That way you'll always get reminded that we're going live, just so you don't forget. And I very much look forward to seeing you again next time when you'll always hear me end every show by saying, I'm Dr. Dan. 
sing well.